Welcome everyone to a new episode of Genuine Rockstars and today's Genuine Rockstar is Jasper Ponstein. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jasper. Thank you for having me. Could you tell our audience a little bit about who you are and what you do? I'm a PhD student in vertebrate paleontology at the Museum von Naturkunde and Humboldt University in Berlin, although I'm currently residing in Tilburg in the Netherlands. Um, my main work focuses on the origin of herbivory in tetrapods, so that means like when did the first uh, animals on land start to eat plants, or by specifically focus on the evolution of the lower jaw. You specialize in vertebrate paleontology and on herbivory in Paleozoic tetrapods. What got you interested in paleontology in the first place, and how did you end up in your specific subdiscipline? Well, actually, um, in the zoo in Amsterdam, um, where I used to live. Artists. Artists, exactly. There's this ticket to go to weekly with my parents. And then they, they did have this geological museum and they did have a couple of, I mean, I know now they're, they're replicas, but still they got like this, this Stegosaurus, um, which was super cool. So I, I really got into you know, like this typical kid, got into the dinosaurs. But over the years, like that's, that's still, that still got me. And I see dinosaurs sort of as like the flagship for paleontology. So like most kids got in there through, through dinosaurs. But at some point I started to realize like, uh, why would I specifically want to work on only dinosaurs? Because the definition is kind of arbitrary, I realize. I mean, we share the same bones most of the time, which is the, it's just a variation of the same theme. So from that, I just backed down. I was like, okay, I just want to work on tetrapods because that's recognizable. It's close to home. We have the same bones. So you can like do bone by bone comparison. And why this specific topic? Why the origin of herbivory? Um, so I'm more interested in like large scale ecological questions. Um, but still want to stick close to the fossils themselves. So I just took a um, remarkable event, which is the origin of herbivory, and thereby allowing um, diversification of like terrestrial life. Um, and therefore, I decided to work on a topic like that, which is very underrepresented. Yeah, it's and there's this thing about the big meat eaters. Everybody wants to work on the big meat eaters. Right? Even though it's, it's, it's way more remarkable that they were able to eat plants. I mean, it's way more difficult to eat plants than it is to eat meat. You study the jaws of Paleozoic tetrapods. So how they physically like chew on a leaf or? Yes. Well, like, not just leaves, just any sorts of um, vegetative matter. But the key word is um, high fiber and cellulose, because that's the, uh, the main molecule that contains a lot of energy. Um, so that, that's the thing that makes herbivory a uh, viable niche. Um, but it's very difficult to break down cellulose. So you really need adaptations to your, um, your jaw system to be able to break it down mechanically and or um, invest in uh, dot volume so you're able to, to digest it. And well, obviously, we don't have fossilized guts, and not that many. So that's why I'm focusing on the evolution of the lower jaw. So, like, yeah, how, how did the jaw adapt to this new um, to this new diet? All right. Yeah. So how it moved, how it yeah, more, more like how how it grinds. So you recently published on glowing fur in modern mammals. That is something else. How did a Paleozoic paleontologist end up studying the fur of modern mammals? I must say this started a bit as a joke. It's like a random side project, it's a tangent. So um, I was working at the museum in Berlin um, to one of my colleagues, um, he's also on the paper, it's uh, Eli. Um, he just showed me this new paper on um, glowing fur in flying squirrels. It's like a paper published in 2019 which was actually the first paper that showed um, photographs of luminescent uh, fur. Um, so it's like, first it was for shits and giggles, but we decided to look a bit into the literature and there's hardly anything published. So there was like one paper on weasels, there was one paper on opossums and like a very old manuscript in French on hedgehogs. Uh, but still like they don't show photographs. So we're like, you know what? We have this massive collection of mammal furs at the museum. Let's go there with a flashlight and see what else luminesces. A flashlight or a UV light? It's the same thing. Okay, that makes sense. When you say flashlight, I'm like, there's a burglar coming. <laughs> flashlight. UV torch, uh, wood lamp, you know, whatever. Okay, so can you please tell us what you've discovered and what this means? At first, we wanted to confirm discoveries that we found in the literature, which 
we were for the most part, but then again, we also realized that uh, from a luminescent species, not all the specimens actually luminesced. And there was in part, because most of the specimens were pretty old, so they were collected in the 1800s. And there was like no documentation on how they were preserved, how they were kept, how they were collected. So we already figured, okay, there's something going on um, with how they are kept. And then at the same time, we're also like reading literature. We found that there's this um, protein called porphyrin that's actually responsible, that's actually luminescent under UV light and turns pink. So, so that was already known from uh, bird feathers, um, like in the plumage of birds, it turns pink. And it's like, so there were some very recent papers in 2020, 2021 that showed there was porphyrin in mammals too. But what we were able to show is that the porphyrins were actually residing within the hairs, not on top of it. So the porphyrins came from the body. Um, and our hypothesis now is that um, like there's, there's a lot of um, cells in the body that produce porphyrin because it's one of the main constituents of heme hemoglobin. So it's very important, very vital biomolecules are produced a lot. But in high quantities, it can be uh, lethal. It can lead to uh, all sorts of diseases. So it's one way for an animal to um, get rid of these porphyrins. So some excrete it through the urine, to their, uh, to their poop. But some stored in their hairs, uh, we find. And um, like previously, people thought, okay, we only find luminescence in uh, nocturnal animals and not in their daytime active relatives, which people then thought had an ecological function. But no. Porphyrins readily degrade under sunlight. So both groups of animals readily produce porphyrins. It's just that it's better preserved in nocturnal animals. Because they don't they don't step into the light. All right, so I cannot help but imagine that um, like night in the museum, it's nighttime, it's dark, it's all closed, the guards are home, and you're walking through the museum with your UV lamp. How do you study this? Well, fortunately, it's already dark in the museum. So we did it during daytime, but they, they can like they can like close it off. And then you should add like the white lab coat because you're in a collection. This study is on mammals, uh, more of the modern than fossils even. Are there other animals that glow under UV light? It's been mostly studied in invertebrates. So I guess like a very common example are scorpions that turn blue under UV light. Probably it's a different uh, biomolecule that causes the luminescence, but still. And like recently, it's been studied in, in mammals, in uh, in birds, in all sorts of lizards, in geckos, in chameleons, in in in, in frogs, in toads, in fish, uh, tardigrades. Pretty cool. They do it too. <laughs> there's 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 a whole bunch, and we we probably just like barely scratched the surface. But if you ask about fossils, like yes, because we do know that porphyrins can be preserved in the fossil record for a long time. And some animals, like squirrels, store them inside their bones as well. So we know specimens from the Ice Age, squirrel bones that luminesce on the UV light. So I'm going to go out on a limb here. Could there be an organism that sees in UV that detects other animals because they glow in the dark? No, in fact, there's a lot of animals that can see in UV, uh, even mammals, perceiving uh, photoluminescence is not necessarily the same thing as seeing UV light. So say luminescence happens like across the board. So if a certain compound luminesces under say blue light, it doesn't mean you can see it different because you can see blue. Oh, yeah. it's, it's, just, it's just a byproduct. In modern crime series, you know, the, you get the forensic investigator he's on the scene he's in a car he shines his uv light and he sees like blood and snot and i don't know what else uh, human secrete i don't want to talk about it um so bodily fluids so there's a lot of compounds that that light up under uv um why is that do you think it's all a secretion because it's you cannot have for instance, too much porphyrin in your body? We also uh, do excrete um, some porphyrins through our urine. That's right. Like GPs do study urine if they expect you to have a certain kidney disease because that leads to overproduction of porphyrins and that's noticeable in your urine. So yeah, it's actually being used. So I now imagine the forensic investigator being like, with this light, like, oh, oh, this man had kidney disease. Cause of death. 
which advice do you have for our viewers that also would like to pursue a career in vertebrate paleontology? Go start out volunteering in a museum or a zoo. You learn the most by actually doing, by working on the projects. You get to meet people in the field. It's, you know, it's a very small field, so it's very helpful to, to know people. Go on excavations. I mean, I don't know where your viewers are based, but if they have the opportunity to go to like maybe an open quarry or maybe uh, like join a summer excavation, I would totally do that. I mean, that's how, that's how we met in the first place. I was going to say we met in Wienerswijk. Yeah. I think a very um, specific thing to this study, because it's, we have over 10 authors um, and it's a very diverse study. So we have uh, paleontologists, evolutionary biologists, but on the other hand, we have um, specialists of chemistry that were able to do the chemical analysis. So I also have to thank uh, all the other authors on the paper. And um, it's a good message to the audience, like you cannot do everything by yourself. It's very good to collaborate with other experts. And it's fun. It is, right? Because they know so much stuff about all the other things that we're only barely scraping the surface of. So yeah, no, yeah. Collaboration and having an interdisciplinary team is vital. And you know, there's still a lot to be learned about uh, animals glowing under UV light. So you know what, just go outside <laughs> in the forest at night with the UV lab and see what else lights up. And maybe I will see your paper in the next couple of years. No, I'm just checking to see. I'm sorry, officer. Yeah, I mean, okay, don't go out uh, by yourself. If you go out at night, like take a friend with you. Okay, thank you again so much, Jasper. You're a genuine rock star. Thank you very much.